I'm here with Bruce Guberman, who just flew in in this plane behind us. Bruce, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, this airplane is a Volte BT-13, built in 1941, and they made uh, 11,537 of these aircraft during World War II. And uh, they built these airplanes uh, between 1939 and they ended uh, the production in uh, the summer of 1944. And these airplanes were used for basic training for cadets during World War II. Would you have us, would you give us a tour around? Sure, we'll take you around the airplane. Okay, over here you have your pitot tube where you, you uh, get your measurement for airspeed. This is one of your landing lights right here. Make sure that this is all secured. Here's your landing gear. This airplane has fixed landing gear. It's not retractable gear. And this down here is a little footstep for hand cranking the airplane. You'd be up on the wing. You'd put your uh, left foot out here and insert a crank inside this area right here to hand crank the engine in the event you had a bad starter or a dead battery. Okay, the propeller is a Hamilton Standard propeller. It's a constant speed type propeller. And the engine's a Pratt Whitney 985, and it uh, has 450 horsepower. It's a nine-cylinder engine, radial engine. And uh, with these older engines, one of the main precautions you have to take is prior to start, you need to make sure there's no oil in the bottom cylinders. And normally you do that by pulling the prop through uh, carefully with the mag switch off prior to flight. Make sure that there's no oil down in there. They call that hydraulic locket. It could be, it could do serious damage to the engine. This right here is what they call a jack point, and it's fixed on this airplane. So if the airplane needed to be jacked up for maintenance, replacement of tires or brakes, you could put a ground jack on this on both sides and jack the airplane up. Okay, we're down at the tail section here. You can see this is your vertical stabilizer, horizontal stabilizer here and you have a steerable tail wheel down below there and this boot down here is just to protect this area so dirt and debris won't get into this area here. This is a BT-13A model. On some of the BT-13Bs they uh, actually had wood fuselages. The aft fuselage section was made out of wood and, uh, and that was because they had a shortage of metal during the war and actually some of these trim tabs would be wood too instead of metal. There really aren't any of those flying around because the parts are impossible to find and if you did find that the wood wouldn't be any good. Uh, here's your rudder and this has a metal trim tab on this one and of course this has fabric on the uh, rudder here. And this is your tail nav light, which is normally white on this airplane. And again, here's your elevator. If you notice, this airplane has dual elevator trim tabs on this airplane. And of course, they work simultaneously up and down together through a lever in the cockpit. We're here in the cockpit of the BT-13. And I'm going to go through some of the instruments uh, that the airplane had during World War II. There are some equipment in here that uh, was was not available during that uh, time period but this is your suction gauge and the pilot normally would look at this and you'd see 4.6 to 5.2 uh, it should run right about in the middle of the green and that's going to tell you have the correct amount of suction pressure to drive your uh, instruments which in this case it would drive the direction of gyro the attitude directional indicator or artificial horizon and the turn and bank indicator which is vacuum driven in this one where some of the more modern day airplanes have electrically driven turn and bank indicators. This is the altimeter, airspeed indicator, vertical speed, magnetic compass, this over here is a hand primer, fuel primer for starting the engine and this is your manifold pressure. That's a gauge you would use for power settings on the engine. And this is your RPM, which is what the propeller RPM is turning. And this is a navigation aid right here, your VOR ILS receiver. 
Uh, this is cylinder head temperature. And these are some of your engine gauges over here, which this top needle here would be just oil temperature. The left needle over here would be your oil pressure. And the right needle over here would be your fuel pressure on the engine. This is a clock. And of course, we don't have the old World War II type radios. It has more of a, it's a modern radio King KX-155. And I have a KT-76A transponder. This is a magneto switch. You can see it's in the off position. Prior to start, you would normally uh, prime the engine with fuel, make sure the area is clear, and you would engage the starter, which is down here. And after the propeller turns through about five blades or so, you would go ahead and switch this to both, and that would uh, actuate the magnetos, make them hot, so the engine then would fire. And some of the other switches down here, you have, here's your battery switch, which you would actually turn that on prior to the start. This is a generator switch, left and right landing light switches. This is a passing light, which is just next to the left landing light out on the wing. That was used during World War II, but it's not used today. And of course, this is your navigation lights, which we talked about those. Outside the airplane, you have one on each wing tip and one on the tail. And this is a panel light switch for night operations. You would turn this on. And then there is a rheostat down over here, which you can adjust your instrument lighting. And th this is a fuel light switch to illuminate your fuel gauges, which are down below my feet. And this is a, a beacon, or in this case, it's actually a strobe light. Uh, for night operation and this is a radio master switch and this is your pedo heat in the event that you were in inclement weather you would turn this on to prevent any ice formation on the pedo tube and of course which I mentioned earlier this is actually a guarded starter switch and this switch which says boost is a boost coil for facilitating starting when you do start the airplane gives you an additional spark and these are circuit breakers for the aircraft, some cabin ventilation and heating. And it also has an adjustment for that suction gauge. You can actually adjust the suction through this mechanism here. And this is uh, an amp meter. Tells you what your uh, voltage output of the uh, generator is and what the load, amp load is on the electrical system. Okay, and this is your control stick in the middle. And uh, as you would use like in any other airplane, uh, you would pull back the climb and uh, push forward slightly to descend and move the stick to the left to bank and turn to the left and you'd move the stick to the right to bank and turn to the right. And of course it has rudder puddles. They're fully adjustable. In other words, uh, for a taller or a shorter person, you can adjust them according to your height. So this airplane could accommodate, you know, uh, a fairly tall or shorter person. And the seat is adjustable only vertically. You can go up and down on the seat. There are some other controls. If you could see those from where your position is, this is your fuel selector. And you, there's actually a handle here for turning the fuel selector. And this is a carburetor heat control right here. And this is an oil shutter for the oil cooler. Depending if you're operating in warmer or very, very cold conditions, you would close the oil shutter up. And of course, your throttle is to the left here. Moving it forward increases power, and pulling it back decreases power. And this is the propeller control which is what controls that RPM gauge over here to the right. I mentioned that earlier. And this is a mixture control. On start, you would push the mixture full forward. And in flight, you would lean the mixture back to change the fuel-air ratio uh, into the engine.